having a classroom of discovery. And um, just a minute, I have to close that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you're going to have a good time. I've been having a good time because we have been talking with one another a couple, about a half an hour now and uh, learning a lot of uh, some of the, the tricks that um, Kirsten is going to share. Um, as a, as a uh, participant, the way we manage it is to have uh, everybody just keep their mic off during the session uh, and then raise your hand, uh, what, you know, the electronic hand um, with, uh, if, you need, if you have something you wanna say. And uh, that works so people, it, it gets a um, lot of echoing if you don't do it that way. So we're anxious to have you speak, but if you just kind of make sure that uh, when the whole group is together that the mic are off. Um, then um, the next, uh, the session, I, I kind of took what uh, Kirsten had said, I'm afraid I didn't tell you who I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Margaret Hill and was the, the lead person in organizing the uh, to thing today. And so uh, Kirsten has sent me all of her materials and all of that kind of thing. And we've talked with one another. And I was trying to come up with an overview statement for this program. And in essence, uh, the goal uh, is to show how to engage students in historical thinking using active strategies with primary sources of all kinds. And it's the all kinds that makes it kind of interesting. So it's not just reading, it's not just dealing with big words, it's asking questions of all the different kinds of sources that you might have. So it's being a detective more than it's being uh, a literature person. So I think many, that's where many of the students get very interested in things based on the primary sources. So um, she's, uh, Kirsten has already dealt with uh, some of you that the material she's using, you will have access to, and um, they're in the chat. And uh, what we'll try to do is make sure you get access to everything that you need. And so um, we'll, at the last few minutes, we'll try to make sure that that occurs. Um, to get to know a little bit about Kirsten, uh, it's on this slide a little bit, but um, I think it, it's, uh, first off, I'm Margaret Hill and she's Kirsten Hill, and, but there's no relation. So I didn't just go get my relatives to, <laughs> to make a presentation. Uh, she is from the James Monroe School in Desert Sands. Uh, and it's a, dis, uh, a school that's highly rated and uh, as is uh, Desert Sands District in the, in the desert uh, uh, near Palm Springs. Uh, she is a, a, a TOSA or a teacher on special assignment who's working with uh, educators uh, in her district and a larger group now uh, because she's now uh, being one of the um, lecturers for the uh, 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 teacher prep program for multi-subject uh, teachers. And it's become a strong program at the CSU um, uh, campus uh, in, in at, uh, the desert campus, uh, what's the other? Uh, Palm uh, Desert campus. Palm Desert, I couldn't think of that word. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, she is uh, a representative, and her last but not least, is she is the representative for our region, Council for Social Studies is ICAS. The state region is CCSS, California Council for Social Studies. She represents our region on the board of directors for the Council for Social Studies. So we're really proud to have somebody who is a great teacher. She helps other teachers, and then she represents us all at the same time. So go for it, Kirsten. We're going to have a great day. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill. I hope that the AVID strategies, anyone, by the way, raise your hand or write in chat. Are you an AVID school or have you been AVID trained? I will be bringing some of those great strategies in. I see some nods out there. And also I um, have had extensive training in, with English learners. So I'm gonna bring that in here as well because I know that as Californians, we need to reach all, all means all. And in all of our classrooms, we have students with diverse needs. So, and my aim is to reach both elementary and secondary. I've got secondary colleagues that I conferred with when I created the presentation. So I hope that no matter your experience level, you'll get something out of this on how we engage our students more fully with primary sources. 
So the, the objectives today are, th there are three. We're going to gain strategies to inspire your students to think like a historian while analyzing primary sources. We're going to learn how to locate and engage students with primary sources for your grade level and topic. I see half of us have already accessed Library of Congress, but I'll also show you some additional ones. We'll learn how to locate the relevant kinder through 12th grade trade books that um, might reflect your student's area of interest, but more importantly, also pair with some of those primary sources uh, so that you can enrich their knowledge of the topic and also to build on their cultural capital. These are great books I can't wait to share with you. Again, the link um, is in the chat. And if you're just joining us, I'm going to put that link in the chat for you right now so that you can fill out your participant information. And um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And um, go ahead and look at the agenda uh, as I put that link in our chat for our new participant that's just joined. And I'm also going to make public right now all of the informational uh, resources that I'm providing during this webinar. It is a one pager in the spirit of AVID for those of you who are AVID trained. So if you've just joined us, the links are now in the chat to provide me with a little information about you so that I can learn what level do you teach. I can learn about your familiarity with primary sources and the resources I'm about to share. Um, and also uh, take a minute to look at the uh, one pager that I put in the chat. We'll go over a few of these instructional strategies, but most importantly, I hope that that one pager you can take away, it's public, you can share it with colleagues as well. I give credit appropriately to Dr. Priscilla Porter, who shared many of those ideas and resources with me as well. So we will get started. Uh, first, we're going to start with why. Why primary sources? I'm preaching to the choir with half of you because exactly half on, your, on the, the respondents have used them before. But um, we're going to go first with a concrete definition. A primary source is a source created by those who participated in or witnessed the events of the past. I know as for students, they have a hard time defining primary versus secondary, especially with my pre-service teachers. A secondary source is created by those who derive information from a primary source. So some examples of a primary source, as Dr. Hill alluded to, are it's not limited to just one type. There are many. It could be films, artifacts, drawings, oral histories, diaries, photos, artifacts. But since we're in Zoom, we're going to look at images for this one. But the skills and the strategies we're using will be transferable to different primary sources that you might look at. And of course, a secondary source could be a textbook or an article. And if you've ever read that book that Dr. Hill put in the flyer for this, um, examining the evidence, you probably also know there's some slippery sources. Some are primary, some are secondary, depending on the purpose for which you're using them. But for the simplicity sake for a webinar, this is just the simple definition we'll go through today. So why teach primary sources? Could I pick on one volunteer to be my example? Because as I told you, I'm AVID trained. And if you've taught in Zoom, you know it does not work for everyone to unmute and to speak all at once. So to engage our students and to keep them accountable, because we've been talking a while, we want student voices. Would anyone like to unmute to be my student who reads just the parts in blue? I'm just looking for one volunteer to unmute and read the blue parts. Just raise your real hand and I'll pick on you. <laughs> All right, Rebecca, thank you for raising your hand. So Rebecca is going to unmute. She'll be my student. But for those of you who have your camera on right now, if you were my students, I would expect to see fish lips. I will, you're going to read with Rebecca. Anything in blue, I will see you reading as she's reading. And if you've taught in Zoom, which we probably all have during distance learning, this was one way I kept uh, students engaged. So I will read in black and, Re and Rebecca, you will read in blue. As we all know, students learn and remember best, not what they are told, but what they discover for themselves. Good fish lips, Christine. I saw that you were reading along with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thumbs up from her. Thanks, Wendell. <laughs> so that's a quote from that book. We know that just telling them what they need to know for history is not going to work. We need to design. We are architects of deeper learning as educators. Design an experience for students to discover for themselves. And primary sources are the best manipulative with which students can do that. So now looking at the next paragraph, would um, anyone like to volunteer to be the student for the next paragraph? 
All right, thanks, Wendell. You'll be the student. So you're you're in blue, but I want Dr. Hill, Christine, Rebecca. I should still see you reading fish lips. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Wendell. Students need to become visually literate. That is to develop the ability to look at an image, analyze it, and decode it. Students need to read the images in the same sense that they read text. And often the same skills are involved. So it is really interesting to me to see, wow, the same high level skills involved in reading and decoding text are going to be used when we read and decode uh, a primary source. Here's an example of that. Um, in that book that I had just shared, uh, Examining the Evidence, Robin uh, J. Fogarty, which is one, she's one of the authors of How to Teach Thinking Skills Within Common Core. Um, of the 21st, of the, sorry, of the 21 thinking skills, a conversation with students learning about primary sources, that would ask students to use at least the following skills. That's many of those 21 skills. So we're not going to take time to place those on Bloom's taxonomy right now, but you get the idea that if an administrator were coming to evaluate your lesson and you were choosing primary source analysis, certainly in a post-conference, you could argue for some high levels of rigor that have just happened in your classroom because there's so many high levels, levels of rigor you can reach depending on the questions you ask the students. So today's activity will involve how can we craft the right questions to ask students when we look at primary sources? And I think most importantly, how can we inspire students to craft their own high level questions? Because that's what historians do. I'm not an official historian at all, but I know that historians ask the right questions to dig deeper. How can we have the, that responsibility shouldered onto our students to start asking those questions and to be involved in that rigor. So let's look at two different ways to engage students with primary sources. Um, in our little form, I can see that a couple of us have um, used the Library of Congress, still three, sorry, three people have. So um, I'm going to encourage you, if you're joining us late, as Dr. Hill said, let's make this an informal conversation among colleagues. If you have dug deeper with these and you'd like to unmute and share what has worked for you, then please do so. But I'm going to share one way that I think works because it maximizes student engagement and student accountability, but also gives scaffolding for our English learners and kids that need our support and aren't ready to do that on their own. So like I said, if you're familiar with the Library of Congress tools, I'm going to click on the templates those again are in that one page of resources that I've shared with you. Um, I'm going to click on that now so you can see. This is the teacher's guide and analysis tool. Just a quick thumbs up or type yes in chat. Have you clicked on and used these different types of tools before? No? Okay. This I think is amazing because the way you read a text is not necessarily the same way we would read an image or an artifact or a map. I was talking to a colleague who teaches history at La Quinta High School this week, and she said, our goal right now is we want students to really analyze documents. And so she thought it was great that we could customize one of these tools. There's one for analyzing text. And I took that one and I thought, you know what, this is great, um, but I want to bring it to, let's, let's get an example. Uh, today we're looking at analyzing photographs and prints. This is what it looks like on the Library of Congress website. It's a teacher's guide. This is not student friendly. Students wouldn't fill this out as a worksheet, but it basically follows the format. If I'm sure at least three of us are familiar. Observe, reflect, question. And those are not in that order. It becomes an organic process. We go back and forth between the columns and it gives you ideas of how to ask deeper questions with students. But what I found in working with some pre-service teachers and working with students is that it's nice to customize this page depending on the source that we're looking at. So for today's webinar, I've shared with you in the chat that one pager of primary sources and I've made them customizable. There's customizable questions depending on the source that we're looking at. And I just created four templates so far for music, um, some teachers and I looked at the Kauia bird songs. We live in the Coachella Valley and the bird songs are amazing. We listened to some, to some recordings. And at first it was just 
we can't tell very much, but using that template, we were able to dig deeper and understand more of the culture. Um, so we'll look at the one today for photos, but I want to go into how we might use that template. Um, well, first, I wanna show you, sorry. We're gonna look at the photos one. Um, I looked at the Library of Congress that I just showed you and I transferred it onto an editable Google Doc. And I added some imagery, especially for my English learners. When I observe, I have some built-in senses that I can observe with. I can see, I can hear, I can feel. I can feel with my hands, I can feel with my heart. That's an observation as well. How does it make you feel? It's important, especially with print or music. Um, I can, you can edit the questions you want students to answer edit the reflection questions. What kind of hypotheses do we want them to take or to generate rather? And then the reminder is to go back and forth between the columns as there's no correct order. So I envisioned a way that we might use this template. Orally, it could be my guide as a teacher to guide students and asking them the right questions about the sources to dig in deeper. But I think it's powerful as a poster. Imagine your English learners trying to go back in their mind to what happened last week when we analyzed a certain source. If it's on the wall, if for example, I did this as a class orally, but then after, after my period was over, I wrote down some of the observations that students made or wrote down some of the reflections or wrote down some of those questions that students had. That's like an anchor chart. I can go back to it. We can build on it. We can now compare two different documents or two different sources. And that's a great scaffold for our English learners. Um, but I feel like what we really want students to do when they become historians, when they do history, like Dr. Porter says, primary sources are the manipulatives of history. We want them to handle them, to touch them, to make their own meaning. I think having small group roles, which we're about to practice in breakout rooms, this is what I think could be fun even for um, middle and high school students. Or if we get to the point where you feel like you've got a proficient student that can really go with one who's less proficient, maybe we can do pairs and that structure sage and scribe. We'll practice that in a second breakout room. But let's look at the big why. Why would I bother doing this? Well, like I said, use it as an anchor chart on classroom walls. It's also good visual support for English learners because students can then see both the question form and the answer form. I think visual tools are important at any level, elementary or secondary. So let's practice what that could look like for us. Uh, again, this is the tool. It's linked in the resources page that I put in the chat. But for now, we're going to go to breakout rooms. I'm going to put that link in the chat as well. And in the breakout rooms, we're going to engage with that primary source analysis tool that I just talked about. We're going to highlight at the end of the breakout time, one reflection that you came up with your group or one question to share out with the whole group. Because ultimately we want these primary sources to launch inquiry. If we start a lesson or a topic or unit with a primary source and the kids really get deep into it, if that can launch some genuine inquiry, then we've we've done our job to spark our students. Um, but I also acknowledge that some of us in this room have used this a lot. If this is old hat for you, you've already used these primary source analysis tools, perhaps this extension activity might better serve your students because they've already been using these tools. Your students know how to use them. If that's the case, I'm challenging you or in spirit of UDL, I'm giving you a choice if this is what you prefer to do. Um, change the level one questions that you might come up with those right there questions to a level two or level three question. So as part of my AVID training, we looked a lot into Costa's levels. What is a level one question? Hold up one finger if you'd humor me and point to your pretend page. A level one question is right there. You can find the answer. I might say, what is the teacher holding in that image of the classroom? Well, the answer is right there. You can see it. A level two question would be two fingers. So you can humor me, put up two fingers. <laughs> Two fingers, a level two question. It's both on the page, but also you might have to make an inference. So it's on the page and in your mind, that's level two. You might have to infer, you might have to uh, compare, you might have to do something off the page. It's a little bit deeper. Level three, I don't have a third hand, so we're actually going to use our foot, which I'm not putting in Zoom right now. It's one finger on the page, <laughs> one finger on my mind, 
and then the foot to kick it out the door, apply it to the real world. That's what I would call a level three question. Something that's bigger, beyond this image, beyond this primary source, how is this applying to the real world? Or how is this applying to the larger topic? And this is where we can really launch into inquiry. Um, so if I, I did this activity with some fifth graders and I tell you, it was hard to get them to ask questions. Ironically, it was easier to have kindergartners <laughs> ask questions. I think students like to hear answers. <laughs> Some of them don't like to take the risk for questions. So this flip book that I put at the bottom of the slide, again, you have access to the slides in the resources that I put. This flip book is awesome for your students and it's accessible for you as well. If you're encouraging students to ask those higher level questions, which are on the third column, I'll go back and show you the third column of our primary source analysis tools where we want kids to ask the questions. Costa's levels of questioning will help them ask deeper and better questions of the source. And that could really launch powerful inquiry and discovery in the classroom. So this is the Costa's levels of thinking flipbook. You can cut it, they can keep it. I know this is elementary, but it's a powerful tool because it gives them some keywords for level one questions and some keywords for level two questions and level three and so on. So that is the extension activity. If you and your breaker room feel like I need to spend the time digging into this uh, a little bit deeper, how would I use this to challenge my secondary students to ask deeper questions? One activity would be this. If your students have come up with who was, what, what did, where was, those questions, change that level one question to a level two question, then change the level two question to level three. It could still be around the same core information. So um, going into breakout rooms, so it took me long to explain that little extension activity, but the slides I'm going to put in the chat, the slides look like this. There's only going to be two breakout rooms. There's not too many of us. We're gonna have two breakout rooms. So you're either going to be working on slide one because you're in breakout room one, waiting for that to load. That way you have an image fresh. If you click view and then present, you'll have that right away. I didn't put the link in the chat yet. I just wanna explain it first and then I'll put the link in there. Um, breakout room one will be recording. It's editable for anyone on the internet. So um, for example, you'll have four or five other people in the room with you. The reason why I chose roles is this. I feel like if we want students to be historians and do history, we want them to engage as fully as possible. And I know that if I assigned this randomly, we all know some of our students would hide out and not do it. And that one student in the group would do all the writing and do all of the work. So there are roles that I'm suggesting that I've seen work powerfully, at least with fifth graders. I think this could work for probably fourth and up. Um, the facilitator would ask the questions of the source. So once you have it open, I will put the link in the chat. The facilitator will, will ask, what do you notice first? What are people and what people and objects are shown and so on. But remember, this is organic. There might be a member that says, wait a second, I've got a question. What, what's this? That's okay. You can stop and write the question. We want students to be able to, to speak what they are noticing. The timekeeper role, let's say, um, just present, pretend, pretend that's a Wendell. He would motion when there's two minutes left to say, okay, stop, we need to share out. This is where the accountability, accountability comes in. If you're doing this in your classroom and your kids are sitting at tables, then I would end this with a whole group share out. That timekeeper would say, okay, stop, two minutes, let's highlight what we're going to share out. What's that one question we really landed on that we think is most engaging or intriguing about the source? Or what hypothesis did we come up with that we wanna share with the whole group? So that's a timekeeper. And let's just say that Dr. Hill is the scribe. Then her role would be to double click. So these boxes, you can type in them. You just have to double click. And then she might write down what she heard the team members say. Maybe not everything, but the gist. And the spokesperson. The spokesperson just pretend it's Rebecca. Rebecca might share with the whole group. And let's say you have five members, I would just say you might have two different facilitators and the timekeeper would have to you know, split that time in half. <laughs> Sometimes we have groups of five. You never have a perfect even number of kids in any given day. You've got absent kids, right? It always happens. So I would say you can have two spokespeople or you might have two facilitators and the timekeeper would say, all right, five minutes, you're the facilitator, five minutes, the other person's the facilitator. 
that way you can share that. Ultimately, the facilitator is acting like the teacher, asking the questions, but they're here. They're on the document. You as a teacher can control what those questions are. Um, so we're going to all erase your name. Wendell, you're not obligated to be the timekeeper. No, as Dr. Hall, you get to be the scribe. The scribe is the one who writes. I'm just putting examples there. So I will now put that link in our chat so that everyone can go ahead and um, be part of the breakout rooms. And I'm going to set those breakout rooms open for about seven minutes. Uh, let's see. All right, here we go. It's going in the chat. So give me a thumbs up once you're ready to open it. That way I know everyone's ready. Um, so I'll put link for breakout rooms. Okay, please give me a thumbs up once that link is working. All right, Wendell's got a thumbs up. Is it working for anyone else besides him? Good, Rebecca's. All right, awesome. That way you know it works for someone who's outside of Desert Sands as well. All right, so you've got that. I see Wendell has popped on. I want to make sure that we've all popped on. Someone anonymous has popped on. That's great. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I will stop sharing so that I can create breakout rooms for us. Here we go. We'll do two breakout rooms. Um, let's see, yep. We'll do two breakout rooms and I will, oh, it doesn't let me set the time on here. I'm not, it doesn't let me do that, Dr. Hill. I can't tell it how much time. So <laughs> once you get in that breakout room, the timekeeper is really gonna have to do their job to set it for seven minutes. Is that okay? Thumbs up everyone, seven minutes. I'll type that in the chat because it's not allowing me to automatically do that. But they're created, oh yes, now it's, now it's allowing me to. Okay, so we're going to, set the breakout rooms to close after seven minutes. But, and again, I will pop in there just to answer, ask any questions. But before I do, does anyone have any questions about what we're doing with our roles in our breakout rooms? Okay. All right. So we have Todd with us, and we also have Mr. Hill with us as well. Um, I will change it so multiple participants can share. I'm going to go to the other breakout room and make sure that anyone can share their screen as well. Do we just write it on the slide? Mm -hmm. Yep, we can write it directly on the slide, and any of you can share your screen as well. Awesome. All right. Looks like there's three of us in four roles. <laughs> okay, are you guys, um, what do you want to do here? Should we? Um, Do you want me to be the facilitator? All right, so let, let me be the facilitator. And if you guys could unmute, I guess that would be good too. We could just kind of talk through uh observations and then uh looking at the document can you see the document have you been able to pull it up no not yet it's like a schoolroom picture 
It's in the slide deck too. Sorry, I can't find it. Um, it's okay. It's fine. If you if you have the link to the one pager that she has up there, and then you uh, let's see where did she have it? At the very top of her primary sources one pager. There's a link to the slides. Review. It says slides. It, the link is the is the slides, and then you go to, down in the slides. You'll find the the pages for the breakout rooms. I think. Well, she put the link. That's a, it's okay. I'll, I'll listen. All right, we can write it up here. Let's see what I have. And then, Rebecca, okay. what would you like to do? Well, since you have your screen open, then I don't think I could be the scribe. <laughs> oh, you can. Whatever you type will show up, but I'll be the scribe. Okay. Um, I guess I'll be the facilitator. Okay. All right. And okay, then, so. Um, I don't know uh, if you would like to rule, Stacy. Would you like to speak for the group at the end? or? I hear the other or? conversation going on. Um, all right, so if you can, can see the picture, picture, that's the first thing to do is try to find that right, picture. Rebecca, would you like to start us off? We're looking at the slides, and you can ask the first question. Okay, so this means toggling back and forth. Um, so how about this? I'll share my screen. So, um, hey, Jim and Todd, yeah, do you see them yet? Toggling back and forth because we're in Zoom. Ideally, we'd have no. this, you know. No, we don't have the picture of the, screen, the classroom. Yeah, this okay. is okay. I'm not following. Okay. Okay, there it is. So uh, for the object, I think that's for the object. Okay, so the picture itself um, is like a, a essentially classroom at the desks, the and the kids are all sitting at the desks. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, oh, it's well, black and white picture. Uh, there's a there's a blackboard at the front. Just looks like two female <laughs> teachers all dressed in very traditional like uh, early mid, early 1900s type uh, clothing um, there's um, a picture on drawn by um, on the white on the chalkboard it looks like a picture of a squirrel or a, a beaver or something like that female teachers I so you can hear the conversation kind of going on in the background from the other group, it sounds like here. Yes. Yeah. So, so when you when you look at the picture, the, the first question happy. is like, what do you notice first? And this student the first doesn't look happy. In the, um, in the, on, the, on the document that we're looking like at. And then they, it goes on, what do you notice Anyone first? What people and objects are shown? I can't. Till quite, rain. But, uh, it looks to me like uh, not everybody's the same age group. It seems like there's a range of, of sizes in the room. That doesn't necessarily right. mean it's. Okay, so what I'm going to do is also the number of students what I noticed, in okay. the classroom are smaller than most of the classes in our, our schools. And they've got uh, two people in uh, 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 leadership with the teachers. Which is right. Uh, better, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe the class size we should ask about. It looks like a very homogeneous class, very very including the teachers. Right. But it's kind of hard to see the images that large. They've got rabbits on their desk. They do. That would be my question. Why do oh. they have live rabbits on their desk, and why do some kids have them and some don't? I see uh -huh. that now. Okay. I didn't notice that. So oh, they must be kind of pictures that's on the front. Well, the breakout room is about to close, but I say this leaves us with questions. When was this? 
Is this a classroom today? Tom go? No. It's early twentieth century. Mm-hmm. Right. I was like dress. Okay, guys. So, uh, you know, we'll just kind of figure this out because I think you overheard a lot of the conversation from the other group they're about the, the uh, document. The we'll just leave the breakout room, I guess, and go back to the main room and we'll figure it out as we go. Right. We're going to go back to the main session now. All right, we are back. I know that wasn't a lot of time, but you can imagine if we were in person, that would be a lot easier. One person said it's hard to toggle back and forth between the image that we're analyzing and the sheet that we're going off of. So ideally we'd have the sheet printed out. We'd have the image up on a screen. And one article I read said, we need to make sure that kids have it in their hands. It's a tactile experience. I would print it out for them. Um, but ultimately the more we ask those questions, the more kids get comfortable with asking them. And it hopefully will be innate for them to start asking those hard questions about the source. Um, that's what we talked about in our breakout room. We had a lot of questions. <laughs> What's on their desk? Why do they have rabbits? Is this science class? What kind of class is this? What, what did breakout room two think? Breakout room two had some trouble just getting to the document at first, but I think we looked and noticed that, that it's a historical black and white primary source picture first. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also noticed the, uh, the, the drawings on the, the blackboard with the, that looks like a beaver or a squirrel or some other animals. Then we of course noticed the rabbits on the desks. So presuming then we, the question is, what, what do you think is being taught in the classroom? It's, it's a science lesson, presumably, uh, but that's about as far as we got. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. Um, so I think that if we had had more time, our students could come up with some of their questions and maybe some of their level two and level three questions about that image. And this was our, uh, this was our image that we all looked at. And I'm sorry, I know it's cumbersome when we're in a Zoom, but um, ideally if we had our students doing this with the roles, they have different jobs. I would hope that then students would one day be able to more independently analyze a document or a primary source on their own. So um, moving right along, we didn't have time for extension activity. I wasn't sure who'd be joining us. I think that classroom culture is extremely important. So we're going to cheer for the members in your team. I think it's important to do that even at the secondary level. <laughs> I'll show you what this means. This is my avid cheer wheel and this is the disco cheer. Oh, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> But we've been sitting in breakout room, and I think we deserve a cheer because, like you said, Wendell, it is hard to sometimes access that document, and it's cumbersome in Zoom. But we did it. We persevered, and we engaged with that primary source. So this is the disco cheer. We do the staying alive dance as you sing, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, we did a good job, good job. <laughs> so if you feel comfortable, you don't have to unmute. You say, or another way is that's the way. Uh huh, uh huh. I like it, and you can let the kids stand up and they love to do that cheer. So um, that is the disco cheer. And I think it's important after we do group work, as cheesy as it feels, there's some non-cheesy cheers in here for you secondary folks, just like sparkler cheer, sparkling for your team or giving them snaps, everyone snapping. We need to do that because it's, it's a lot of risk to, for students to take those roles with each other. But ultimately, I hope that more and more students will do those. So, um, I'm just going to, in the interest of time, we've got 20 minutes left. I'm going to share this activity, but I don't think we're going to go and break our rooms to do it. It's called put yourself in the picture. And even if you teach secondary, I really think your English learners especially would love this activity. It's useful as a kickoff or an intro to a topic. It uses an engaging primary image or print. Um, and this is what it looks like. I'm going to click on it and show you um, from the slides. This is how it looks. I'm asking students, I did this with some pre-service teachers, and this was one of their favorite activities. Um, it's a structure called Sage and Scribe. Partner A would be the Sage. Partner B would be the Scribe to write down what Partner A says. And they would engage with the primary source. Partner A would say, I see, and, and the Scribe would write it. Then for the next one for here, they switch roles. Partner B 
would be able to be the sage and they would say, well, if I were in this picture, let me give the example, I'm sorry. If I were looking at, we're actually going to look at the Boston massacre. I'm going to fast forward and show you that one. If I were looking at this primary source, the Boston massacre, then I might pick one of the figures on the page. And I might say, if I were, if I were this guy right here, what would I see? What would I hear? And those teachers were starting to see, oh, what would I feel? I'd feel the weight of my friend. I'm trying to hold him up. What would I smell? I might smell the smoke of guns around me. What would I hear? Probably nothing. There's a gun firing right behind my head. And they would engage themselves, putting them in the picture. And then they had a much more tangible experience, even though this is not really what happened. We're just saying, <laughs> this is Paul Revere's propaganda of what the Boston massacre could have been like, but what senses did he want his audience to feel when looking at this picture? So the sage and scribe, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to unpresent. The sage and scribe structure is really powerful, especially if we intentionally set up our students so that they share one paper, share one pencil, and we announce the roles. One is the sage, one is the scribe. And if you have English learners, pairing them strategically with a non-English learner would really help. So what is it? It's the template I shared. It engages all five senses. And um, I would give one copy of the worksheet. And the purpose is to help students engage fully with the source. It works well with prints and photographs. And what I would do is give them um, a little copy of the list of sensory words. I put that in the slides so that as your kids look for, at primary sources, sometimes they don't have the language to describe what they're seeing or what they would be hearing in that image. So I would give them a sensory details word list. I think in a history classroom, this is like the playing field. We learn skills in our ELA class, but in our history class, this is where like the basketball game is played. This is the playing field. This is why we have sensory details. This is where we apply our ELA skills. So I recommend having this as a go-to list, even in a history classroom. This is the basic worksheet. We're not going to go in breakout rooms, but my original idea was that we would go in pairs. One person would be the sage and the other person would scribe and write it out. It works best in person with one paper, one pencil, and we share it back and forth. Um, but it's a powerful activity considering our English learners that need to engage let's be there in the scene. What was it like? And then I read another article. This would be a fun game um, for kids at any level. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to advance. If you look at that photograph of the classroom that we just analyzed, you can play a hide and seek game. Pretend that you're hiding in a certain place and the teacher goes around and says, okay, who's hiding here? And, you know, on top of the teacher's head and the kids kind of can look for close details. I thought that was an interesting game. Uh, we're not going to stop for a cheer right now, but we will after the next activity. I want to go ahead and give you some ideas of where we can find these primary sources. Um, Dr. Porter had written a resource um, for engaging with primary sources. And for a few of us who have gone to the Library of Congress, it looks like this. Um, if you're on the resources one pager that I put in the chat, you can access this as well. Um, but it's really easy to look at primary source sets. I wanted to point out, if you haven't been here before, that it's organized not only by era, but also by recommended grade level. So if I teach third through fifth grade, there are actually six, um, sorry, quite a few different sets that, is, that are recommended. Uh, when you click on one of them of interest, I wanted to also point out that below the many different types of primary sources that are recommended, you can also see toward the bottom, the teacher's guide. It gives you guidance, it gives you background. It gives also some activities that are suggestions for teachers for using these sets of primary sources and some additional resources as well. But my favorite thing that I wanted to share out with you that my colleague at La Quinta High School didn't know is that whatever you're teaching, whatever level, whatever topic, you can ask a librarian at the Library of Congress live in a live chat Monday through Friday from noon to four. Sorry, it's Eastern time. So it's going to end at one o'clock California time. But at least during your lunch, if you can live chat and say, hey, I don't have primary sources that work well for this topic. And they can help you locate what you need because I feel like this is crucial for making it come alive for our students. Um, 
that is one thing I wanted to point out. And the second thing I wanted to show is that the National Archives also has primary source analysis worksheets as well. And the Smithsonian has an engaging students with primary sources guide. Um, this would be for a couple of us on our forum who said you don't usually use primary sources. If that's you, I would start here. If this is brand new to you, maybe your one takeaway from the webinar is that you're going to engage with this a little bit more deeply because it gives really great guidance on what to do with different types of primary sources, photographs versus oral history versus objects. And um, this is a great starting point if you're, if you're one of those who are relatively new to primary sources. So I just wanted to give a minute or two, go ahead and unmute or type in chat if you have questions. Um, see if you can, um, oh, I see. Do you happen to have the link to media literacy meeting? That's interesting. Um, Stacy, can you tell us more about that? I didn't um, think I've seen that before. Or has anyone else seen the link to that? No, no I'm sorry. I was trying, I, I meant to send it to Peg. Okay, Long got story, it. But I'm, I'm double booked and I can't find the link to the the other, um, the other no meeting. Problem. And so I was going to watch this on re recorded and oh, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No problem, no problem. I thought maybe that's a resource I don't know about, but Rebecca's yes. hand is also raised. Rebecca, did you want to share something? Well, I have a question actually. Uh, with the resources for the Smithsonian's re regarding yes. objects, are they objects at the Smithsonian? That's a great question. Um, I don't think I'm on that link anymore. Let me go back to it. Um, I believe they're, link they're objects at the Smithsonian, which lends itself to being an image for your students. But my idea for that, and I did think about it, believe it or not, was if you see an object, you might need students to connect to the sensory experience. So would this be hard? Would it be soft? Let's go back to that sensory worksheet. Can you find something that might feel the same as this or be the same size in terms of scale for this? Because we couldn't bring it to our kids, but. Um, when I taught a Kauai Indians unit, I had several things that I could bring in. Um, but I think if it were at the Smithsonian, I'm sure they would give you the, um, it's on page 46. I'll scroll there really quickly. Sorry, shield your eyes because it's gonna make you get a headache right now. I'm scrolling down there for you, Rebecca. <laughs> um, that's a great question, Rebecca. And if you don't mind, I can research that further and I will write that down and I can email you back if you type in on the little form at the end, is that okay? Yeah, okay. So we're only at oral history, you have to keep going. So objects, um, here's where it would start on page 46. And I think what you could do is bring an object that could be similar, like one today and compare it to a baseball catcher's mask from long ago. This might be an opportunity for comparison if you bring something similar from today versus long ago. And there's tips for reading the objects. I think that's more fun because it's a sensory thing for kids. Is it okay if I get back to you on that, Rebecca? Awesome. Any other questions? And I'll share the last bit, which I think is the best part. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, where to find trade books to spark historical inquiry? If their inquiry is not yet sparked by the great source you've shared and going through asking questions and going through as a group with it, this will be sure to get your students' interest. I would recommend starting with a picture book and pairing it with a primary source. Even if you teach ninth through 12th, some of these titles I think will work well. It's the UC Davis History Project. I learned about it from the California Council for Social Studies online um, conference last March. And I emailed um, Dr. Cortez who compiled this list and she said, yes, you can share it out, it's public. And this is an amazing resource because there are over 300 titles curated for elementary alone. And they are organized in a great way to help you filter down what you're looking for. So let's say you are teaching us, you're teaching about exploration and you are at the secondary level. Um, you can do a Google, you can do a sort Anything that has an X in the exploration column, you can bring those up to the top and see which titles can be similar. So perhaps there's a trade book that you want to use to introduce that. Um, Road to Revolution, the 13 colonies. This happens to be fifth grade history. There's also middle school. It's organized um, 
not only by the title, but it will have racial diversity, social justice, all different titles or sorry, topics that might interest your students. Like I said, if our students don't see themselves represented in the four walls of the classroom, it's harder to capture their heart and their interest. So, you know, perhaps you need to go into disability. Do you have a student with a disability that feels alone, that feels where are people in history that share my disability? Why don't I read about them? This would be a chance to bring that in. Um, so one example I had, I'm gonna click away from here for a minute, but this is also in our resources page, um, is that I would include um, this top, I would start with your topic, pair it with a primary source, reflect your students' cultures in the classroom, and also represent multiple perspectives. This is a chance to bring in different perspectives and keep their, their interest. Uh, so here's an example that they shared at the UC Davis History Project. This is a primary, sorry, secondary source called All the Way to the Top, how one girl's fight for Americans with disabilities changed everything. But here's the primary source, that's her. She's the little girl on the title. And if we're talking about it, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or we're talking about the role of government, or we're talking about civics, what do citizens do? What is our role in the government? This can be applicable at multiple grade levels, I felt, especially if you teach um, benchmark advance, if your district does. And I know that <laughs> that unit one is government and not it's not the popular one, but if we can bring it to what's important to kids and they see, oh, kids can have an effect on, on the government and then bring in some primary sources. What have Americans with disabilities done to advocate for their rights? I think this is an example of how you compare primary source with the trade book and um, capture the interests of your students. So um, I want to give everyone just a couple minutes of silence. I will stop talking so that you can, and I'll put the link in the chat so that you can have time to explore this great resource and maybe look for a topic that links to what you are actually uh, doing with your class right now. And, and many of these are actually available on YouTube so that you do not have to feel that you need to um, go out and Amazon right away and purchase that. So I'm just going to put links to um, picture books. And these are picture books to spark historical inquiry. So that is now in the chat for everyone. So go ahead and take a minute to, um, to look and then I'll answer any questions or perhaps type in chat one title. That's what our takeaway was going to be here. Type in chat one title that you would include and why. So we're going to type, I would include blank book title in order to blank. Which one might be relevant for your teaching right now? I'll put that in chat. Okay, um, we're going to stop to, uh, for general questions, but has anyone found a book that strikes your interest that you might link to something you're teaching in class right now? You can raise your virtual hand, your real hand, or just go ahead and unmute.
Okay, I see in chat, um, I'm actually using the 28 days right now for eighth graders in US history. I read a day and then have the students write one word that comes to mind after learning about that person or event. Then I have them pair share with their partner one thing they learned and we go around the room and share everyone's one word. It's like an ad hoc person group poem that honors the person or event. I really like that. I've never looked at 28 days. That's a great idea. Thank you, Stacy, for sharing that. Um, and Wendell says, I would include ABCs of Black history to introduce students to topics in Black History Month, ethnic studies topics. Okay. All right. I'm glad the students are enjoying that, Stacy. Um, this, I thought, is just a wealth of books. If I needed to talk about one theme, then I, this is where I'd go. Even if you teach secondary, if you look on my screen right now, they've got books about perspective, cause and effect causes and consequences, changes over time, comparing and contrasting, continuity and change, uh, themes through history that maybe are hard because they're intangible, but these picture books make them more concrete. And of course, to pray our primary source to go with it. Okay, great. I know we don't have a lot of time right now, but if we did, we could take more time to dig into it. Thank you for sharing that, Stacy. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. We're going to close up. Um, so if you are part of the California Council for Social Studies, I bet UC Davis, I think, will be presenting again this year. Um, but they had a great um, session last time on these exact picture books that start spark historical inquiry. And this was just one of those many examples of how to pair a primary source with a picture book. So now it's time for liftoff with our students. What is one takeaway from this presentation? Um, this is called, um, oh, you know what? I don't think that I'm going to use the Menti right now. <laughs> I created it a couple of days ago and I have a feeling that the link has already expired. So um, it, well, it says it's there though. It says, what is one takeaway from today's presentation? And if you just enter the word, I'll show you everyone's um, response. So I'm going to copy that and put it in chat, and then we'll see if that actually works. Um, so I will type and please add a takeaway. Is it open? Can I get a thumbs up if it's working for anyone? Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. All right, the various sources for using primary documents. Awesome, very fun and usable. Thank you for writing that in the chat. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> All right, great resources for using primary documents. Thank you. I'll see if I can open up the mentee if it allows me to. Does anyone have any questions? Besides, I will get back to you, Rebecca, regarding the objects. It would be great if we could have um, objects that we can have on loan to bring to a classroom, but I know they wouldn't if they're historically <laughs> significant, probably, but I'd love to get concrete things in the students' hands. Um, oh, I see. The link to the results are at the bottom, hidden in the screen. That's why I can't show you right now. Okay, I know that when you, when you go to the Smithsonian, they often have these um, wonderful guide sheets that will guide students or people to a, a specific object. Like for example, we're doing Lewis and Clark. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it'd be wonderful to have close up photographs or visuals of the actual compass that Lewis and Clark used. I could bring in any old compass, but to have them see that one would be so much more meaningful. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. At least to bring in an actual compass from today, if you couldn't bring, you know what I mean? Like bring it something from today so they can compare it to the picture of what it would look like from the past. They could hold it and make some more tangible connections. But here are the responses so far. We've got a few. They would be bigger if we had two that, had, that were exactly the same. But um, Thank you for the, the feedback, everyone. I appreciate that. Thank you for your takeaways. I, I know that this is a whole mountain of resources I've given you. Hopefully at least one thing could be new, a way of engaging your students. I hope that um, you value your students as historians because then they will value themselves. If we value what they think and we honor their questions and we honor what's important to them, 
then they will internalize that and they will start to see themselves as historians, not just as students. So um, that, if that would be one thing I could give, that's what I would impart to everyone um, for our students. So um, I want to say thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I'd like you to um, feel free if you want to do the survey, I'm going to copy that link and put it right now in the chat. It's the last slide. If you have um, any type of suggestion for me, because I do want to be better as an instructional coach and as a teacher, um, I will gladly take any um, constructive feedback and putting the survey link in the chat if anyone would like to add anything. But uh, thank you so much for joining me on a middle of the week when we're all tired. <laughs> I hope that you're excited to try some of these things with your students. So thanks for everyone for joining and, us. And, and Kristen, I think we all, uh, if we could make it loud, we could make an applause because it was just uh, everybody learned uh, in, in that was here, you know, and no matter how many years they've taught, it's just a, an amazing job you did. And um, you made us all uh, want you to come back. <laughs> you are you that I don't know what you call it when you were doing it on Zoom. It's not really the door that's open, but the, the we'll we'll get you a URL where you want to be. <laughs> I would love okay. to would love to uh, share that. So uh, uh, it's really quite fun that uh, uh, to have somebody like you that's sharing and and talking about it in a collegial way with with teachers because I think. Uh, it, you're going to be kind of like the Pied Piper with with people following a lot of the things that you have suggested. So um, just to let other people know, our um, uh, by teachers for teachers program, uh, the next one will be in April. I don't have a date set for it because we we have the different districts do the spring break at different times of the year, and it uh, gets to be complicated with setting all those up. But um, what I would really like is if there are members of our audience here that were, uh, as they watched today, what was happening, if you have some ideas that you'd like to share in this kind of informal way of uh, showing what happened with your students and what works and way, things you've learned by doing it, those types of things. If you have an idea, let's share it with other teachers, especially new teachers. And uh, the, the level, the grade level doesn't matter because so many things that we were learning today from a person who works in the elementary classroom uh, could be done at any grade level. And so that, you know, that sharing and, and uh, I, your ideas with each other is really important. And so if uh, you have that, that possibility, um, every time I send something from ICAS, the, the um, email address is there. And so all of the documents that you've gotten and telling you to sign you know, to sign up for this program, there's always that email there and that's how you get to me. And I would be glad to talk with you. If you wanna stay afterwards to share your ideas, I'd love that. Um, I'm hoping uh, to see a number of you at CCSS uh, on, on the 4th to the 6th is when it's gonna be happening this year. I think the big day is gonna be the 5th, which is Saturday. And um, it's just an amazing amount of, of activity is happening from lots of uh, sessions, all grade levels, we'll, you'll be hitting those. There will be uh, outside speakers, you know, uh, keynote type speakers. There will be uh, uh, awards for, uh, for the state will be there, all sorts of things. Uh, if you want to uh, add anything to that, uh, Kirsten, because you've been at those meetings more than I have, um, but it's a, a once a year chance to meet colleagues all around the state. And uh, the last thing uh, is, uh, I, I think, I, I just think we need an applause for, for Kirsten. So I'm going to turn my my mute, uh, I won't put me uh, my mute on, I'm just gonna clap right now. <laughs> I hope the rest of you also. It was very, very, very uh, uh, interesting, the whole thing and uh, very well thought through. And uh, I'll be thinking of this for quite some time, all the different ideas you came up with because they applied across the board for everybody. And I appreciate it very much. And uh, the ideas you were sharing as well, other 
uh, Rebecca especially was very helpful. And uh, yes, thank well, you. I um, credit to Dr. Porter and others from whom I beg, borrow, and steal these ideas. <laughs> I mentioned in the slides. That's what we do as teachers. So Absolutely. thank you for joining me as collaborators and as colleagues on, you know, we're all on the same team to do what's best for the for students. So thank you for your participation. It was nice to meet you all. And I will hang out here a little while longer. If anybody has an idea that they want to share and participate in this by Teachers for Teachers uh, little group, we do it once a month. And uh, Tuesday at four in the afternoon. And uh, we'll try not to hit it uh, against uh, another major event happening, uh, but uh, that happened this time. Anybody wanna volunteer? And Todd, Stacy? Stacy's not with us because she's at the other session. It goes for another hour. Stacy wondered, she can't find the link to it that you could send. Stacy says, I'll give it some thought and get back to you. Link to the um, other program. The other I don't have it handy either. Okay. There we go. Houston, hopefully you can go home tonight and rest and have a little dinner with family. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have another presentation tomorrow for AVID, so I'm going to work on that. Oh, swell. What's <laughs> going on? Do but... you ever get your weekends? Because you, you worked on this one on uh, the holiday on Monday. So Yeah, I did. But that's okay. I feel like I'm getting faster at it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. It was really good to meet you both. And I appreciate your support and what you're doing for the Council for Social Studies. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I hope that I will see you again sometime soon. Okay, good. Are you going to the conference in March? Uh, we'll be just Saturday is the only day I can do. And okay. so we'll be there then. All right. Well, maybe I'll meet you there. I will be there as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, I think we have ended it.